Last week we looked not only at the passage in the latter part of Acts chapter 2, if you remember, regarding how the church came together in time of need and great growth in Jerusalem. We also looked at the encounter that Jesus had with the rich young ruler as well as places also where Jesus talked about placing the kingdom of God as priority in life, even over family, he says, brothers, sisters, mother, father, and so on. You know, we looked at some, what for us are some fairly tough verses, some tough passages in the Bible. Today, I'd like to get right into some additional places in the New Testament that address the overall theme of this class, which is the church family. But before we get to those, I want to look for a little while at the culture of the Jews of that day and also that general Mediterranean region in the time of Christ. I think that's important. And I, uh, we're also going to give a quick look here at what some of the early church fathers had to say about the church family in the second and third centuries. And I'm not, going to, I'm not a historian. I don't like a lot of history. Uh, I know some of you do. I'm just going to kind of go over this fairly quickly, I think. Just to give you an idea, if you want more information about it, if you're an historian and you want to know more about it, um, there are books and things on YouTube, not YouTube, things on the internet and so on that talk about that, and you can do a little research on that. And after we become then more familiar with that culture, the culture of that day and that time, as it relates to the family and family relationships, we'll go on to some of those what many might call even tougher passages in the New Testament than the ones that we've already studied. First thing that needs to be understood when we look back at the culture of that day, and I've, I've said this phrase before, but the first thing that needs to be understood is the idea of a strong group culture. That's what they call it, a strong group culture. Strong group culture is one where the person who belongs to some kind of a group of people, that person looks out for the welfare of that group over their own individual happiness and satisfaction. The well-being of the group trumps my own well-being if I'm a member of that group. That'd be a good way to say that. The needs of the group outweigh my own needs. In the ancient world, this kind of a strong group culture is an accurate description of how things really were in, in daily life. People automatically assumed back then that the groups to which they belonged took priority over their individual lives. It didn't matter if that group was their community, their neighborhood, their church or their synagogue, their family, uh, or some other group. The needs of the group outweighed the needs of the individual. There are a couple of quotes from the 1960s, if you're old enough to remember that far. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands as to how many will remember the 1960s. Further defines this kind of a strong group culture. John F. Kennedy's inaugural speech, if you recall parts of that, and one of the famous lines, he said, Ask not... What your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. That's a prime example of that kind of thinking, the strong group culture kind of thinking. And there's another quote. Um, how many of you are trekkers? Don't raise your hand timidly. Be brave and say you are. And some of you may not even know what that is. And if you don't know, you know you're not. Yeah. Those of you who are trekkers are going to recognize this one by Mr. Spock, no less. There you go. And in The Wrath of Khan, the movie The Wrath of Khan, I can, I, I can still do that. In the movie The Wrath of Khan, where Spock dies saving the ship, he says, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, right before he dies. And Admiral Kirk completes that thought as Spock gives his life for the crew. What did Kirk say? 
and you raise your hand. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Kirk responds, or the one. Or the one. The thought behind that statement didn't originate with Spock, by the way. As far as can be discerned, that thought's a lot more ancient. In fact, that thought is biblical in nature, at least as far as the Bible records someone having that thought, if not those exact words. Surprised? The thought came to us in the Bible from an unlikely source, Caiaphas, you know who Caiaphas was? Caiaphas, the high priest mentioned in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 11, Caiaphas says this regarding Jesus, verse 49, for those of you that are looking it up, you know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. Of course, he said this, they were discussing the killing of Jesus. It's more expedient for the one to die rather than ruin the whole culture. A little earlier in history, Aristotle in his The Aim of Man develops a similar idea in his discussion of what he calls the highest good. He writes this. This is Aristotle. Even supposing the chief good to be eventually the aim for the individual as for the state, that of the state is evidently of greater and more fundamental importance both to attain and to preserve. The securing of one individual's good is cause for rejoicing, but to secure the good of the nation or a city-state is nobler and more divine. And look at the Apostle Paul. Paul had this to say regarding his desire for salvation of the Jews. Romans chapter 9. I have deep sorrow and unceasing anguish, unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off for Christ for the sake of my brothers, my own flesh and blood, the people of Israel. Paul said, you know, if I could, if I could sacrifice myself for the sake of the Jewish nation, That's the strong group culture. Not many in today's Western culture really take this thought of the strong group culture seriously. Think how you relate to the groups that make up much of your daily life. Employer, school, government, even the church, neighborhood, family. Many of us never ask what we can do for these groups. Rather, we want to know what they can do for us. How much are they going to pay us? What are the benefits? What education will I receive? I want my streets paved. I want police and fire protection. My church, I want it to help me grow in my personal relationship to God. Can you think of people in this culture who do willingly sacrifice for the good of others? They're there. Teachers come to mind. I'm sorry. Teachers love their job and want to teach despite. Yeah, uh, teachers that, that really are passionate, love their jobs, love their kids, uh, spend their own money, um, work long hours, work extra hours, uh, go, to these, go to the homes of these kids, check on them, see to their needs, bring shoes for them. You name it, whatever. Yeah, sure. Who else? The fire department and police department. There. Yeah, yeah. Fire, police, public service, EMS, that that kind of thing. Sure. 
The military. Military, big one right there. It's an all-volunteer military. You know, you go because you go because you sign up. Nobody's forcing you, like they did in my day. You know, you go because you want to. Yeah, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. Same thing with police, fire, public service. The needs of the many outweigh my needs. Yeah, there are people who do willingly put themselves in danger for the good of others, even today. You know, sometimes you'll even see some kind of a daring rescue or some other such deed done by an ordinary citizen. You'll see that sometimes on the news, or if you're a YouTube addict, you'll sometimes you'll see that on YouTube or, or wherever. You know, these are people who at times will put other people first. They'll pull somebody out of a burning house or a car, just a neighbor, or somebody down the street or whatever. You know, and, and they'll, they'll, they'll basically say, I didn't even think about it. I just knew I needed to do something. But it feels very normal for us in Western culture to think in personal terms. What's good for me? After all, we've been indoctrinated with this kind of thinking from our youngest days. We develop personal goals. We utilize or actually in a more coarse way, C-O-A-R-S-E, a more coarse way, we use groups and institutions in society to realize those personal goals. We basically have three major life decisions to make besides our decision to follow Jesus. Number one, what am I going to do with my life? Number two, who am I going to spend my life with? And number three, where am I going to live? What am I going to do with life? Who am I going to spend my life with? And where am I going to live? In the strong group societal model of the first century, those three questions were often answered not by yourself, but they were answered by others for you. Others in the groups that you were a member of, your parents, by the community, by your family, by your religion, those questions were answered for you. In ancient times, one often took on the vocation of his father or family rather than going out on his own because that's what his father or family said he was going to do. Marriages were often arranged by heads of families, many times when the kids were very young. And the idea of moving away and living in a new area just never occurred to many people because it would break up that strong group family and neighborhood dynamic. Stop and think. In the musical play Fiddler on the Roof, or is it Roof? Which is it, Roof or Roof? Yeah. Yes, okay. <laughs> all three of those life decisions, if you remember that play, all three of those life decisions come into sharp focus if you recall the plot and the story. Jewish life, even that was as was portrayed then, was based on the strong group model, model emphasizing family and community groups. Next time you watch that musical, think about that. Think about that. What am I going to do with my life? Who am I going to spend my life with, and where am I going to live? One notable exception, I think, you may not agree, but one notable exception in my mind to the individualistic mindset in Western culture is one that I think is right here in Wichita. And yes, I agree, teachers, fire, police, military, you know, I understand that. But it's one that we here in the church, at least church staff, encounter regularly. Those who are homeless or those who are chronically poor and on the margins, and you're going like this. You're wanting to know, yeah, yeah, we'll get there, Elaine. Those who are poor, those who are homeless, on the margins will often share what meager resources they may have with those in their homeless or marginal groups who have even less than they do. The expectation is that they do so. The group expects, if someone has an extra $5, the group expects them to share it with the group. Or if they've got extra food, the group expects them to share that extra food. 
And if they don't, what they have may well be appropriated by the others, often while that person's asleep. We see this regularly here. Someone may be on the verge of having their electric service shut off for non-payment. Going to shut it off in two or three days if they don't make the payment, and the payment's hundreds of dollars. Yet they willingly run an extension cord to their next door neighbor who already has had their service cut off so the neighbor can have a fridge, microwave, and a TV. It's illegal, but they do it anyway. Or someone might have a few gallons of gas in their car. No way to get any more. But yet they'll take their friends, their family, their neighbors to the grocery store, the doctor, ferry their kids to school for them until they too run out of gas. They go to a food pantry. They often will share what they've got with others, even if it means they won't have much to eat the next few days. People who've managed to have a place to live will share that place with sometimes many others who have no place to live, at least until their landlord finds out about it and evicts them for violation of their lease. The guests use their electric, their water, their heat, eat their food, use their transportation, and it's all done willingly by the one who is renting the apartment or their house, even though they themselves have very little and they're on the verge of homelessness themselves. We see this over and over again. Maybe they know something about the strong group culture that we don't know. I don't know. I've often remarked to Linda and others in the office that I just don't understand how someone can do that. Knowing that they won't themselves have what they need if they share. Linda and I, and I think Curtis and I even have had conversations about that. And we admit that even after, I admit that even after several years of seeing this, talking with some of those in those communities who do this, I still don't fully comprehend what they're doing and why. Okay. Let's summarize this as far as the early church is concerned. And for this summary, I'm going to quote from When the Church Was a Family, the book by Joseph Hellerman. Here's what he says. <laughs> The Christian communities established by Peter, Paul, and others in the Roman Empire were strong group, surrogate family units in which the good of the group took priority over the desires and aspirations of the individual members. This worldview resulted in some very specific behaviors and relational expectations that in turn distinguished the Christian church as unique among the various social and religious groups in the Greco-Roman world. Indeed, the social solidarity that the early Christians enjoyed as a result of living out their strong group family values ultimately brought a whole pagan empire to its knees. Such was the power of community as God intended it. Such was the power of the church when the church was a family. Okay, let's briefly now go to a different part of this strong group idea. Let's take a closer look at the relationship between marriage and blood families in the ancient Jewish world. In that world, although marriage was an important part of life, it wasn't the primary relationship between individuals. Marriages were designed back then to do three basic things. Number one, strengthen the extended family by building alliances with other families and enhancing the status of the families involved through marriage. If you wanted to do that, marry somebody important, I guess. Number two, produce legitimate offspring, preferably one of which would be male for many societal reasons. And number three, appropriately and within societal norms, preserve and transfer property to the next generation. Those were the three primary purposes of marriage. Enhance the status of the family, have legitimate kids, and preserve the family's wealth so it can go to the next generation. 
You notice I didn't say anything in there about love, romance, any of that. No consideration of either the bride or the groom. Nothing about personal satisfaction. Nothing about compatibility. <clears throat> Pretty much all relates back to the status of the family or in some way or another the preservation of the family as a whole. <clears throat> and if this is so in the ancient world, and it is, and it still exists today in some parts of the world, where does a person who is married to someone that he or she may not even know before they get married, where do they go to for emotional support, for encouragement, a sense of belonging, or identity? Where do they go? Melissa, you look very interested in this. <laughs> You got a comment? No? Okay. In the ancient world and in some societies of today, <clears throat> siblings, not spouses, identify as a family unit. Even after marriage, the bond with brothers and sisters, with siblings, both for the husband as well as the wife, that's the premier relationship in a strong group society and the society of that day. That bond is what provides its members with the most intimate, nurturing, and satisfying relationships. Not the bond between husband and wife. That's important, but it's not the primary or the premier relationship. It would be your relationship with your brothers and sisters. It would be the spouse's relationship with his or her brothers or sisters. I don't know if you can see where this is going in terms of the New Testament church, but hopefully you can when you look at the New Testament church and the idea that we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. There's a lot more we can say and there's more that you can read about if you want to. But I want to leave this topic with these principles. Number one, in the New Testament world, the group took priority over the individual. Number two, in the New Testament world, the person's most important group was his blood family. And number three, in the New Testament world, the closest family bond was not marriage, it was the sibling bond. And along with that, there's a couple of corollaries. The central value that characterized ancient family relationships was the obligation to absolute loyalty to one's blood siblings. And two, the most treacherous disloyalty was not disloyalty to a spouse, but rather betrayal of a sibling. And if you're one of the two people writing that down, I can give that to you later if you don't have it all. All right, before we leave this discussion altogether, I want to briefly give you a few quotations from the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th centuries. This is after the New Testament era. Some people that I quote are decidedly not Christians. These quotes have to do with how these non-Christians saw the Christian community of that day. First person I'm going to quote was Julian the Apostate. Nephew of Constantine, Emperor of Rome in 361, Julian himself became emperor, but he did not follow Constantine in terms of Christianity. When he assumed that title, in fact, he began to reverse the Christianization of the empire that was begun by Constantine. In a letter to his friend, I think it's Arsatius, 
High priest of Galatia, this is what Julius wrote, Julian wrote about why Christianity had been so successful in the empire. Here's what he said in the letter. Why do we not observe that it is there, that is the Christians, benevolence to strangers, their care for the graves of the dead, and the pretended holiness of their lives that have done the most to increase atheism. He called Christianity atheism. When the impious Galileans support not only their own poor, but ours as well, all men see that our people lack aid from us. A pagan intellectual named Lucian in 165 AD witnessed one time the imprisonment and death of a Christian, and he had this to say about that man's treatment by his Christian brothers and sisters. When he had been imprisoned, the Christians, regarding the incident as a calamity, left nothing undone in the effort to rescue him, not in any casual way, but with diligence. And from the very break of day, aged widows and orphan children could be seen waiting near the prison while their officials, their Christian officials, even slept inside the prison with him after bribing the guards. Then elaborate meals were brought in. Sacred books of theirs were read aloud. Indeed, people came even from the cities of Asia, sent by the Christians at their common expense to defend and encourage the hero. They show incredible speed when, whenever any such public action is taken. For in no time they lavish their all. Their first lawgiver, Jesus, persuaded them that they are all brothers of one another after they've transgressed once for all by denying the Greek gods and worshiping that crucified sophist himself and living under his laws. Therefore, they despise all things indiscriminately, consider them common property. Look at a couple of quotes from Christians. Clement of Alexandria, Justin Martyr. About 200 AD, Clement mused on the idea of the wealthy giving away everything they had. And he realized the negative repercussions of that. We talked a little bit about that when we talked about Acts chapter 2. Here's what Clement said. How could we feed the hungry and give drink to the thirsty, cover the naked, entertain the homeless, if each of us were himself already in want of all these things? It's on this condition that God praises their, that is the wealthy, financial resources use, and with this stipulation that he commands them to be shared, to give drink to the thirsty, bread to the hungry, to receive the homeless and clothe the naked. What he's saying is we need to do our part as wealthy, but if we give away all we have, we're no longer going to have that to do. Clement goes on. The rich man holds possessions of gold and silver and houses as gifts of God, and from them ministers to the salvation of men for God the giver and knows that he possesses them for his brother's sakes rather than his own. He is a ready inheritor of the kingdom of heaven. And Justin Martyr, about the same time, said this about the practices of the church at Rome. We who once took the most pleasure in the means of increasing our wealth and property now bring what we have into a common fund, and we share with everyone who need. We who hated and killed one another and would not associate with men of different tribes because of their different customs, we now live together. And in the same time frame, a little bit later, Justin described how these resources were collected. Those who have more come to the aid of those who lack. We who are constantly together, those who prosper and wish to do so, may contribute each one as much as he chooses What's collected is deposited with the president, whoever that might have been at the time, and he takes care of orphans and widows and those who are in want on account of sickness or any other cause and those who are in bonds and the strangers who are sojourners among us. I'll close with this part of the lesson with this. In Carthage, Tertullian was in full agreement with Clement and Justin. Here's what he said. We call ourselves brothers, so we who are united in mind and soul have no hesitation about sharing what we have. Everything is in common among us except our wives. I'm glad he put that in there. <laughs> he goes on to say that this common fund is, and I quote, for the support and burial of the poor, for children who are without their parents and means of subsistence, 
for aged men who are confined to the house, likewise for shipwrecked sailors, and for any in the mines or on, isle, on islands or in prison. And even later in history, in the 1500s, we find a continuing emphasis on the strong group, even into that time period. Here's a quote from the book, Telling a Better Story, by a guy by the name of Jonathan Joshua Chatrol, describing the general society of the 1500s. This guy, by the way, is a Ph.D., Southern Baptist University, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He's the executive director for the Center of Public Christianity. This isn't some ordinary guy like me. Here's what he said in the book. Traditional and <clears throat> tradition <clears throat> about, 15, about the 1500s, traditional and religious institutions provided the ultimate framework through which people reason and experience life and they were also the center of community. The idea of the individual as we know it today did not exist. People were instead defined by their family, their community, their rulers, and their religion. There was a general sense of we're all in this together. And if someone stepped out of line, God could judge the whole community. The gap between personal and public was negligible. One's private conduct was a public issue. Much of this mindset, not surprisingly, aligns well with Christianity, particularly the recognition of the divine and the transcendent, the emphasis on community, and the appreciation for tradition and religious institutions. So even up at least until the 1500s, this idea of the strong group in this country carried the day. Okay, let's carry these two main ideas into the next discussion. Ancient Mediterranean societies revolved around the strong group. The idea that the needs of the group outweighed the needs of the individual. Allegiance was to the group, not to the individual. And although people of that day usually belonged to several groups, the group that commanded primary allegiance was the sibling-slash-family group. Comments, questions. If you don't have siblings and you have a very small family group, what do you do? Yeah, you're kind of a ship sailing somewhere. In that culture. And I don't know what happened. You know, if you were the only if you were the only child or your your parents died or yeah, I don't know what happened. Maybe they attached to another group. I don't know. Well, I think those became the, the helpless and the least of these in that society. I think that's why God said take care of them. I mean, that was a... Those a, that didn't have. Yeah, that was a command in the Old Testament. I mean, he made that clear in the Old Testament that you are to take care of those groups of people, you know, leave the corners of your field unharvested for those those people who were on the the outskirts of society and then that continued into the New Testament. And the quotes that I read, there were several that talked about taking care of those that didn't have parents and so on. And and I'm assuming being a surrogate group for them. I found uh, through Douglas and his uh, girlfriend, who is of Hispanic, they are very family oriented, yeah. and everything that you're talking about is really how they are. Yeah, yeah, and there there are cultures even today, and that's one of them. The Hispanic culture in general uh, is one that retains much of that strong group mentality, that strong group idea. You know, the individualistic idea is, I think, I think, um, just kind of a product of us Western Caucasians, you know, Steve. Well, today, I think uh, the farmers in Kansas are pretty much set up that way, especially Amish or the uh, Mennonites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Amish especially. The Mennonites have 
I can speak with some authority here. Uh, the Mennonites have, in many ways, kind of decreased that depends that idea. The, the Amish, yeah, it depends on if they're the old yeah. order, right. whatever. Some of the more progressive, I guess, yeah. of the Mennonite Church USA is a little more on the individualistic side. Right. Um, um, the church that I was a member of during my teen years is still there and so on, but from what I'm hearing and know, it's just not quite the same as it was back then. Uh, Old Order Amish and Old Order Mennonites, however, retain that, you know, uh, uh, the barn raising, where, where, where a group of Amish guys will come and in one or two days build a barn for somebody whose barn maybe burned down or something or blew all, blew away or whatever. Or, or, yeah, or whatever. Or they're just young and starting out or, you know, whatever it is. That's still prevalent in that society. I mean, that's part of the reason why I started going to church altogether is because my family's really dysfunctional and I don't have that group. So I kind of relied on you guys to be my family. Really. And we're glad you're here. <laughs> I love you guys. And you know, I, 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 Hunter, I don't want to embarrass you in any way, but, but, um, but that's that's one of the that's one of the things that elders and staff are really and 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 you guys do a good job of this are really trying to emphasize, especially in this day of COVID or post COVID, is is that idea right there. Um, uh, and Julia's talked about that as well. Uh, in in her life and what's happened with her, um, that we we have to step in, and we should step in, and we should want to step in. Well, for many of us, we're closer to our church family than our real family, not only because of distance, but because of what we believe in. Um, so, for some of us, this is our first family yeah. Yeah. because we have more in common than we do with our yeah. blood family. Yeah, we have more in common with I have more in common with you guys than I do. You know, uh, that's what Ann is saying. With her blood family, she has more in common with those of us who are here than and there and there probably there are probably a lot of people like that, and Well, it's a blessing to be able to find a family where you fit in and you feel loved and edified, and, and you know, we all, we all have the same goal, to serve God and be with Him forever. And it's a blessing to have a church family that puts up with the weird things we do sometimes and the weird things we say sometimes, you know, and, and, you know, I, and I will, I will tell you this, um, you are really good about, at least in public anyway, just letting some of this stuff just kind of run off your back. You know, you don't get up in too much of a dander. You don't send nasty emails to the office. You don't, you know, uh, you don't come to elders' meetings and yell at us. You don't, you know, all of that. Maybe you should sometimes. I don't know. Um, but you do really, a, you really do a good job of that. And I, yeah, I mean, I know when I speak in a public way like this or the blessing or whatever, I, I try to be very careful, and that's why I have a lot of this pretty much written out. But at the same time, sometimes things don't turn out the way you think they should when you say something. And, oh, man, I shouldn't have said that. that didn't work out, you know, that kind of thing. You guys just do a great job of, of putting up with us. I guess I'll just put it that way. And, um, Julie, I think you sometimes feel the same way. Yeah. And I'm sure there are others like that, too. And that was the second bell. And... We will start next week. 
this actually happens to be a place where I can break. Um, we're going to talk about Jesus in that strong group society and how that all worked. And that's where we're going to go next week. <laughs>